Welcome to Glasgow and welcome to Wide Days. We're at a former swimming pool in Govan, which is now the home to Soma Quality Recordings, which celebrates its 30th anniversary this year. We're going to meet Glenn Gibbons and Dave Clark, two of the label's founders, and uh, if you follow me, I'll knock on the door. Fuck off! Ah, maybe try that again. <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought it was somebody else. Morning! Follow me. That's Glenn. He thought it was Dave. So, here we go. Their office used to be next to a, a purveyor of very scary looking weapons, so in the olden days you could go to uh, go and visit them, have a meeting at their label, and then go and stock up on your machete and crossbow collection, but now these are altogether more uh, genteel surroundings, you could say. So uh, here is Glenn. Hi. He's going to show us into the storeroom. 30 years of vinyl and CDs, Soma number one. To Soma six, two, one. This is Corby, social media genius. This is the main Soma office. That pump goes record. Alright, Dave. Hey, it's Dave. So, yeah, no, okay. I go in. <laughs> you thought I was you. <laughs> so, welcome to Local Heroes at Wine Days. Um, celebrating people in the Scottish music industry who are doing great things behind the scenes to launch new talent. Um, I'm Olaf Furness, founder of Wide Days, and my illustrious guests today are Dave Clark and Glenn Gibbons from Soma Quality Recordings, to give it its full name. <laughs> and um, we're going to talk about how the label, events company, and publishing company, and I think there's anything else, radio station, has uh, come together and evolved over the past uh, three decades, because this year is the 30th anniversary. And uh, before that, I thought it'd be interesting to really find out how it all started. What were your first records? What were the first gigs that you went to? And really, when did your interest in music begin? From a very young age, um, my first gig was The Undertones, supported by Edinburgh band TV21. When I was, I was probably in fourth year at school. But preceding that, um, I'd been getting into, my big brother got Tommy Gun in 1978 when I was 11 years old and he bought the jam down in the tube station. And he talked me into buying the Clash English Civil War because he wanted a copy in the house. And then I used my Christmas John Menzies voucher to buy London Calling when it came out. And I'd say that was probably the album that's changed my life. The Clash had a, a common thread also in my relationship with Slam. Stuart was a boy at my school. And on the night the Clash were playing at the Apollo in Glasgow, I'm at the bus stop. We lived in Milton Campsie, about 10 miles north. His friend, two of his friends had tickets, he didn't. I was there, I was supposed to be with my other friend, Gary Kennedy, but his mum wouldn't let him go. He made an excuse that Jaws was debuting, which it was on the TV, and he wanted to stay in and watch Jaws. So I'm at the bus stop, sure to say without a ticket, I'm there with two tickets. Match made in heaven, you know, that was our friendship since then. And uh, after school, Stuart and I, I got my job in a pub that I worked in in the West End where we met Ord, the other half of Slam. I think at the time, Glenn was just in a lot of bands and he was drinking in the pub that we worked in. The studio deposit of education in the very first summer record, Eterna, 
on one side by Slam and Gwen's band Rejuvenation IDO, and the other side was made of just round the corner from that pub. Uh, what was the pub's and name? It was called Chimichungas. It had a Mexican theme. It was very trendy, and it had a restaurant and a, a cafe and a bar. It was massive and a k- kitchen staff and about six taxis. Always used to go to the sub pub on a Saturday night after work. And round the corner, Glenn's pal Nigel Sniffer had a sh- studio in his mum's basement. That's where all the early Soma stuff was made. So I knew a guy that lived it, above Chimichungas actually. Well, it's now the Cooper's Bar. So it's, right. it's the old Coopers and it's, 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 similar, it's a similar layout, it's, it's, it's a similar kind of... And what about you, Glenn? What, is, what was your first sort of foray into music? First foray into music? I mean, I think my earliest gigs were at the Apollo in Glasgow and the very first was maybe by David Bowie, then Thin Lizzy was a, a band that I saw and then I started to get into... In fact, I was at that class gig that Dave and Stuart were at, bizarrely enough. And then lots of... Lots of just loads of gigs that like the Apollo was the place to go, and you, you could go there when you were fourteen and all that. And back in the day, so it wasn't like there was a there was like a, a licensing limit or anything like that. So we used to j- jump off from school when the tickets went on sale at twelve o'clock, and then go and queue for hours to, to get tickets for all these kind of bands that were playing at the Apollo. So, um, so that was my my, my first gigs, but. Um, then I started a band when I left school in the early 80s, um, so I got an indie pop band and we got signed to Virgin Records, uh, made an album, and then a few years later we split up and then I started a, the Scotland's first rap group called Crack. Right, we wow. Supported, we supported the Beastie Boys in their first UK tour. Was that in the Barrowlands? Barrowlands and then the Liverpool gig was, 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 was riots. Riot, the riots. You know, um, they all done stage. Yeah, they did. They, <laughs> they kind of made the mistake of abusing the audience and then uh, I think the was, audience turned on them. I, th- yeah. I think it, was, it wasn't that. It was the press was, it was like punk rock all over <laughs> again. The press were like, these, these Yankee... <laughs> the obs are coming to fuck your daughter, and uh, you know, and it's like so, people were like just ready to kill them as they hit hit the ground because we went on and we get cans and bottles thrown at us when we we started, and then when they came on, it was just a riot. I mean, like Glasgow was bad; it wasn't that bad. But Liverpool, we actually it was a riot. There was an actual riot, and we had to vacate the building with security <laughs> and escorts and all that. And so what, it was, what was the original band before Crack? What were they called? Uh, it's a passion. They were called. Uh, didn't they and um, so you obviously you, you know doing music already you've you know you've been signed um you already touched on it dave with the the first single and the the label coming together were at this point where you're already going out um in clubs listen to uh, dance music electronic music or were you coming at it from a uh, did, was your gateway into it from, from something else? We, we, we sure ordered myself and started a club under the name Slam in the summer of Love 1988 and then we were doing a few different nights at the sub club. We, at, at one point we were doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday at different venues in Glasgow and they were all busy. It was just this whole kind of wave of acid house energy and Glenn would come to some of the nights or we'd be hanging out and they get to sure and odd before we did the club they would be the guys that were fighting about whose tape went on in the bar you know like no listen to this listen to this and you know they started buying records and blagged a few gigs so eventually they were confident enough to say we can play the whole night give us your venue and slam began so that had been happening because of that we got a few you know tour, tour dates then to London or Manchester Sassienda and round about the same time they'd been talk with Glenn and Jim and Nigel about getting together in the studio. So something, once the record was made, we thought, well, we've got the punk rock attitude, do it yourself. Let's just find out how to put a record out, press it up, phone up shop, sell it. Oh, that went okay, let's do another one. You know, it was, it was kind of a hobby. I joked at the time it was a, a reason to get out of bed in the daytime because of these four nights a week clubbing it. You didn't see much daylight. And and how did you um, how did you find out how to make a, a label? Did anyone give you advice, <laughs> or no, did you? Was there any, it's pre-internet, right? So there's no way you could just read up on this. No, it was I, just try 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 and error, wasn't it? I noticed was that a lot of the raves were selling tickets at record shops. So I got a list of record shops up and down the country from 
you know, say DJ Mag or it's equivalent where people were selling rave tickets or club tickets. So we just got the phone numbers, phoned them up and said, we'll send you a box of records. Most of the time they sold the 25 records, sent us a check back. One guy that still owes for that is David Holmes. He had a shop in Belfast called Sugar Sweet. And he got his 25 Zoma once, sold them and then went out of business or did something else. And we never got... David, if you're watching, I know you've a few bought in the movies. <laughs> so, the Dave Holmes, um, have you seen him since the... Oh, since we, the did, we made a record with him, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, we went off with him, but that's what it was like in those days. Everyone was just doing something and getting on with it and working out a way to be involved in this exciting thing called Acid House. And... Um, I mean, even at school, we were, we were like, let's make a fanzine, you know, you just had this idea, you wanted to do something punk rock, something for yourself, something independent, and, you know, 30 years later, we're still an independent record label, which is, which was the dream, really. Was there a point where you, it went from being something that you, you did out of the passion to where you realised... You still got the passion, but when you realise, oh, this is actually my job, this is my my main source of income. Not for a long time. Not, not I mean, because it wasn't our main source of income for a long time. I mean, we were, you know, even with successes with like Daft Punk and stuff like that. You know, until the Daft Punk thing, and we did a kind of a, a kind of distribution deal with a, a major. Then it was it, it wasn't really too much of a proper business and then it started to get more business like I mean, you know, we were out partying quite a lot and running the club nights and stuff like that as well. So things uh, inter intertwined with each other. But um uh, you know <laughs> when it I was mean, a job. It, yeah the scene the scene did become quite corporate at one point. You had your super clubs like Cream and Ministry and you had your <coughs> major labels getting involved and I mean, we kind of toy, you know, touched the edges of that, but we, we, we did have this kind of, we just wanted to have fun and stay independent, make enough to get by. And we, we didn't really plan for the future. We, we just got, got through it and got to the future. I, I quite, especially when you see some of the, uh, the level that maybe someone like Richie Horton, who's a, a, one of the, probably the richest people in techno, that's, he retains some credibility musically, but he's got involved with Saki companies and, you know, he's got a manager that will place him with, you know, he's got good ideas on how to be a businessman. I think even now we, we still hear music, we like get it out and make sure we're doing enough different things that we're paying the bills and, and, and living. I, I, one of my heroes, Joe Strummer, talked about the clash in their tempestuous career over six years. And they were saying, you know, you've, you, 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 you've been on these major labels, you must be loaded. And he's like, we were having so much fun robbing the bank, we forgot to take the money, you know. And I feel like that sometimes with Soma, <laughs> but we are still there. <laughs> and you're, I guess you're, you know, if people know one thing about Soma, it's the fact that you put out the first Daft Punk single, um, Daft da Funk, and... You could not go to a club. I mean, just to really emphasize this, the the impact that had. Um, I was I moved to London, but I was living in you know before I did that, I was living in in Scotland. When that broke, you could not go to a club without hearing that song. It didn't matter what club you went to. It was it was enormous, and I think what's. Um, what I wanted to ask is that obviously that's the one thing. If anyone just knows the one thing about you. Um, that they know about you. So, is this something that is it a kind of double-edged sword? I mean, do you mind, or is it something that you're um, you're quite happy to embrace? I, I think we're proud of it. I mean, I mean <coughs> lately, I've, I've had to do quite a few interviews for people writing books about Daft Punk, or when they decided to call it a day. You know, Radio Scotland wanted someone to talk, and there's a great. BBC documentary recently called Daft Punk Stayed at My House, My House, that is well worth listening to. Um, it's something we're proud of. We actually put their first three singles out. Yeah. They, they had a, a single before the funk and they had one after it called Indo Silver Club. The, the first single contained the, 
the track Alive, which made it onto the homework album. And Thomas sent us a, a lovely message after they, they, they called it a day, you know, saying if, if I hadn't given you guys that cassette, you know, we, you know what would have happened, you know? Thanks for being, you know, part of this incredible journey we went on. And we're still on our own journey. It's a good, it's, it, 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 it's definitely something we're very proud of. And it's not something we think about every day while running the record label, though. I mean, yeah. we, we've certainly moved on and, and try and push forward for, you know, like, trying to take, take the whole label into the future, you know what I mean? It's not something we sit and kind of wonder about. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not like... It's like, always <laughs> sitting looking forward, you know, and, 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 you know, you can use the influences of the past and you can fondly remember, but, yeah, we're, 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 we're kind of... Full focus on on the future. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what with over six hundred single releases and one hundred and twenty album releases, there's <laughs> guess your time's <laughs> going to be taken up on focusing on a lot of uh, a lot of other things. But how did it come together in the you know with Daft Punk? I mean, was that a, a chance encounter? Well, we were all there was a gig in Paris, Euro Disney supposedly, but it moved from, from yeah, Euro Disney complex of, of uh, Euro Disney then. Um, we had done an interview with a fanzine guy, and he'd said to Dave, well, "You need to come and meet our friends uh, in Paris uh, tomorrow, uh, who have who've got a band and they want to give you a demo." And so we met we, them at Thomas, and then we had a couple of days on the way back after the weekend, and we heard the tracks, and we're like, "Fuck, send them to get 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 us like this then." The cassette actually was exactly the way it came out as the four tracker on on it was solo number fourteen, but they they. Heard Slam's Positive Education, which Glenn co-wrote along with Jim Batumi and Stuart and Horn, of course. So it was like a good Soma collaborative record, Soma number eight, and it was the biggest Soma record to date. It had gone all around the world. I remember Stuart Horn and I went to Los Angeles and San Francisco and everyone knew Slam because of this record. Everyone was playing it. And Thomas and Guy were fans of the record and they said to their friend, I want to meet the Soma guys. You know, they just... They like the idea of not being on a French label, not being part of the French scene, because I know they've also sent Laurent Garnier and F Communications some music, but they decided it's a cool thing to do. And then they came on holiday to Glasgow. I'm like, someone from Paris has come to Glasgow on holiday. Is that a first? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Did, I think did we you meet that Dan? Well, did you meet Danielle Van Gard as well? I had quite a bit of time with him, actually, because we went, I went to write at Thomas' house a few times, and we went to meet them in the south of France, and Daniel was giving us all the chat about how to be an ethical music business person, you know, and how the music business and the, even the collection societies were always ripping people off and things to look out for. He, he was a good campaigner, and he's, he's obviously passed the... The knowledge onto Daft Punk. So I think they probably changed the whole nature of the music business and the way deals are done. So they're now licensing deals and you own your own. For sure. Deals. I mean, he was, you know, he, he this is the father uh, of Thomas from ba- Daft Punk. He he was a songwriter and producer in his own right. So the the Gibson brothers hit Cuba, which is, you know, really, I, I think, a kind of precursor uh, house. It's got all the kind of classic yeah. house elements in it. And he wrote that, and he wrote D-I-S-E-O by Otto, I know it, less it, as it, well. His name's Daniel Van Gogh there, but he's, his producer, composer name is Daniel Van Gogh, so you can, you can go and look for him on Discord. Yeah, it's, he's, he's got an illustrious career, and also, yeah, he, he sort of helped them in their fight against the French Collection Society, Sassem, and, you know, exposed a whole load of murky things that they'd done in the, you know, under the Nazi occupation as well. Oh, so uh, mm-hmm. he's, he's some guy. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I digress slightly. It's just like <laughs> one of those those people that I've interviewed over the years that has, has made quite a big, uh, big impact. And, and um, strangely, I met Thomas in France a couple of, well, probably three or four years ago now. And I hadn't seen him for Maybe since he played Rock Ness, which might have been almost a decade before that. And when I saw him, he looked exactly like I remember his dad being when I first met his dad. You know, you get that from people sometimes, you know, like <laughs> almost a carbon copy, you know, once, once, once the years pass. And I mean, I think that you, you obviously touched on the fact that their positive education was this global, um, global phenomenon. I mean, you pretty much look at any 
compilation from that that period that and it, it's on there and I think that this is you know it, it's interesting that you you know to the fact that you mentioned that you co-wrote that um, Glenn and I, I think that this is one of the things that almost always interests me where you've got producers and artists that are also involved on the on the business side and you know to what extent do you are you, do you still get you know get involved in writing and in that that creative process, or have you sort of did you come to a point where you had to focus on on running the label and running the business side? I mean, we started the label just to put our own records. Really, you know, I mean, we we did actually hawk round the, the London record labels to uh, turn an IBO, but nobody nobody bit on it. So, but that's the reason we did release it ourselves, you know, so, uh, and then it kind of went on to, like, to release other artists like One Dove and, and then um, other artists that were in Glasgow at the time, but, I mean, I was making records, uh, the, ten, the, the first five, ten years of the label, the, the input that we had as the business, I mean, obviously we made business decisions as a group, but it was... Mostly the in our decisions, um, what to release on the label, and then they left uh, Richard, who was the manager at the time, and Dave, who was wor- working in the office, um, to to deal with the business side of things. When Richard left, I, I took over managing the label, and at that point, I, I was still making records at that point, but I stopped in two thousand two thousand seven that Richard left, so I had to focus full time on the label because it's such a big thing. And at that time, also Dave kind of moved away and more into the, the event side of things so um, so at that point I stopped I stopped kind of making music essentially you know do you um, miss it? Uh, I do miss it yeah yeah yeah. but it, just, it takes time to make good music you know you can't just bash them out like well some people do you bash them out studio in the house or? no I don't I've got, I've got bits of bits of gear bits of old gear bits of old analogue gear that I've probably lost a few bob but and um, um, do you think you might go back to it at some point? I might make some ambient music when I retire, you know, do some yoga. <laughs> wow, that's a whole, that's a whole <laughs> strand for itself. Good time, Ibiza. Start a yoga retreat. Yeah, well being. Yeah, God, the Kundalini yoga, I did that a few times in the, uh, there's, a, there's a whole kind of Kundalini genre. Yeah. Um, although one of the teachers used to put on like long mixes of Underworld and, uh, <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't move my arms for the week because I'd been flailing to Underworld for 12 minutes. Fine while I was doing it, but uh, afterwards, it, you know, I suffered. But uh, yeah, there's a, there's a market for that sort of thing, you know. Um, and David, have you, ever, have you ever really got involved with the, on the songwriting well, and production not side? Not really. I, I, I contributed uh, some lyrics to a slam song called This World but just because I happened to be right at the studio and they were struggling to... to Find a few, a, a few verses were required, so that that was it was a nice buzz, nice moment. You know, I'm always I always read a lot, um, and I'm Graham from Silicon Souls, a good friend of mine. So occasionally I've sat with him and just mucked about with a track, but and I really enjoyed it. I find it quite relaxing, but I don't know if I would have the patience. And I've I've often thought because people also say to me, you know, why didn't you DJ? And I've just thought, well, if I did, then it probably wouldn't have got anywhere because it would just be three DJs, you know, with no one, like, picking up the pieces and figuring out where do we go with this. <laughs> so, have you pretty much focused on the event side then? And the... Yeah, because we've kind of, over the years, I mean, we, we did every summer, we did tea in the park, and then for about five summers, we were doing a soma stage at Rock Ness. Um, We've been doing pressure pretty much monthly and now probably every few months and monthly at the sub club. And now we've, in the eighth year of the Riverside Festival in Glasgow, so it's, it's pretty much become a full-time job for me where I keep an eye on the slam stuff and help make decisions with them and a bit of management. But with Soma, I'm really just an occasional consultant and, um, you know... Big business decisions. Probably, the, the, probably the directors meetings through the through the nineties. I was probably pretty much doing more for Soma than the events. But I think the nature of the club, the, the club world, and the event world, it used to be not easy to do nights. But it was just it was kind of you did it, and you phoned up the DJ, and you know it just the whole industry changed. So it's now layers of administration and dealing with agents and logistics people and. 
how many really read the contracts and it's more corporate. It's easy to it's easy to lose money and make money. So it really took the full the full attention to be successful at it. You don't have the bucket the the drawer full of cash anymore. <laughs> you have to you have to invoice and, and uh, declare the money. I did, don't I did, tell the tax man. I did love the days when you phoned the DJ up and sent them down a train ticket and they came up and played and they, you know. Everyone was happy. What's wrong with my couch? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean it's not? What do you mean it's not a five-star hotel? <laughs> um, I mean, it's, I was going to ask you about that. You know, really, what was I, Glasgow like in those days, and to what extent is this city also, you know, had a, an influence on what you do and how that how things have developed? Do you think you could have done this anywhere else, or do you think there was something special about Glasgow? I mean, we just lived for me going out. I was at university mm. and it was all about going to see bands. At stu- even the, st- the student unions used to be good. I saw the Smiths at the QM, the Glasgow Uni, REM at Strathclyde University Student Union, oh. not to mention people like the Meteors that we touched upon. Earlier. You too, but too. The whole thing was about yeah. just going out and having a good time and getting into new music and, you know. What were you studying? I studied electronic engineering and uh, touched upon computer science. I could have gone away and been a real rich nerd, you know. I don't know what your brother did. My younger brother, yeah. So, yeah, I just got um, got into the, the, the club scene instead. And I think there was a symbiosis there as well because, I mean, some of the early records, you know, when, when the time Duff Hunt came on holiday to Glasgow before they put a record out with us, Felix the house cat from Chicago was in town because he was playing at the club that we did at the Arches, Slam at the Arches. So he met Daft Punk and he, he brought some dats over. We, we, we got one of his dats off him, which became Soma number 15, I think. So just, just after the Daft Punk Soma 14 single. And, you know, that whole thing where people would, come, Josh Wink would come and hang about and maybe do a remix. So we had this whole scene where, People love the club, they love the audience, they love the partying, and they bring us tracks, and they, Soma would send music out to DJs, you know, post out vinyl, and then Stuart and Orr would get invited to go and play in Berlin or Paris, or, as I mentioned, the West Coast of America. So the whole thing worked hand in hand, you know, the, and the whole Glasgow thing was, I mean, we, I remember, yeah, I think we got a review from from somewhere in America and it was one of the early Soma records and it was, oh, listen to this, Glasgow must be a great place to take drugs. <laughs> it's ever just from this record. <laughs> well, you know, they should have that in some kind of uh, sales uh, sales or promotion <laughs> strategy. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Glasgow, a good, great place to take drugs. It's interesting, though, that you mentioned Chicago because I remember going there and just feeling it was really like Glasgow. It's, you know, it's my f- favorite place that I've visited in the States and there, there was a there was a vibe about it and obviously, you know, it's, it's linked to Chicago House and um, it's seen as a, as an electronic music we, destination. We, I mean, South Park have got great, great relationships with a lot of the Chicago guys. We had Gene Farris on our label and DJ Sleek used to hang about and as Felix, who we mentioned there, DJ Pierre has always... And, and Larry heard Mr. Fingers talking about how much, how spiritual the sub club playing at the sub club is. So they, they, there's a, a great, great relationship between the two cities. Um, and they both could go at the end. Yeah, true. <laughs> it's, um, did you did you have any sort of periods in the, in the 90s that were particular high points or where you were like, right, this is... This is great. I'm I'm now making a living from this, or you know, this is a this is a watershed moment for me. I don't think we actually stopped and thought about it, but when I look back, I mean, by the later nineties, you know, we'd put the Daft Punk records out. We'd started doing the Slam Tentity in the park. The label was, you know. I don't know what would it have been eight eight years old. You know, we you know we're, we're kind of this is what we do. You know, at least I don't know if we thought we'd be able to get paid for it for, for years in, in in advance. But we certainly thought we'd reach ten. 
yeah, it's always just the next one, you know, let's get the next one out, you get the next one out, it still is, you know. Um, I mean, certainly for me, when we made Positive Education, Stuart and I went to Ibiza with the white labels, and we gave them out to loads of DJs like Darren Emerson, Billy Nasty and stuff like that, and I think that year there was loads of kind of mellow kind of tracks coming out, and they played it to death, and that was the first, the first DJs that actually got the record, and... Every club we went to, they played positive education, and the places everywhere went off. So that for me, that was like, all right, something's something's going on here. This is uh, we're doing something, right, you know. So and when someone actually trusts you enough, you hand them a record, they have a they'll quick play it, and then it's on. But before yeah. you got to the bar, right, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did my beats. I gave Darren Emerson the record. And he just played it his first first set. You know. Did so. you? Did, I mean, did, were, were you walking around just going like, <laughs> "That's me. That is, by the way, that's me." Or did you did you just have a kind of sense of quiet satisfaction <laughs> around it? Well, you did break yourself up, but you know, just having fun. <laughs> did you dance to it yourself? Of course, always. <laughs> Hands in the air, jump over, over, over. over. <laughs> and were there any other sort of periods musically then where you, you had those moments where mm-hmm. you there's something that you had put out, or even hearing things in unexpected unexpected places? Yeah, I mean things like Silicon Soul. Right on was a, ma- a massive record everywhere. You, you know, you, anywhere you went, you'd hear it. And we had a great relationship with San Diego's H Foundation, Halo and Hippie. And again, it, it was a real. I mean, you were on the, you were ahead of the, the curve on the way records sounded at that point, definitely. Um, and just the the amount of uh, love you found for for Soma, I think it's. It, it was, it was, I'd say at the start of the kind of noughties, you know, we could do no wrong. I don't think we did necessarily do much wrong after, but there was a point where Pete Tong was all over it. We never really courted the, the, the radio too much or the BBC, but, you know, it would be uh, everyone wanted to know what Slam were doing, everyone wanted to know what's happening at Soma. And who came up with the name? I mean, the, the official name is Soma Quality Recordings, isn't it? Or is well, it? Is well, it that's, still, that's what it said on the original records. Um, I guess Soma Records, Soma Quality Recordings. Soma. I was an Aldous Huxley fan, so I've been reading Brave New World, which Soma is the the panacea drug to keep the population happy, and he got it from. You know, Vedic mythology. It was the, 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 they don't know whether it was a kind of peyote type of strong alcohol or hallucinogenic plant, but it was a. It, it, they had a god, Soma Indra. It was tied in with religion and you know all sorts of states and stuff. So we, we always thought of Soma being something which just gave you an altered state or took you away from the norm and the reality and. The mission of being a, a, an independent label was just to get away from the bland mainstream. And it's interesting because while all this was happening, while you were developing, Glasgow had that parallel musical universe, which, you know, was Teenage Fan Club and the Vaselines and Nirvana checking all these oh, bands yeah. that, you know, well, let's say they were actually from Bells Hill and, you know, right in the back. Oh, but, you know, and oh, it's, it's... Went on tour with the Vaselines and it was a funny story because Eugene from at the time was Eugenius before the Vaseline's um, um, we, we, we were we were going to release a record but Eugene remember we were speaking to him um, about it because it, it, when we started so uh, there was a big indie dance kind of scene so there wasn't so many pigeonholes all the way yeah I mean so it's just like it was it was very open at that time like, happy holidays of course so I mean we were spe- speaking to Eugene about putting a record on Soma and then Nirvana started talking about him and it was like alright he's just going to go and do something but, and, but, you, Eugene know. actually designed the artwork for our second all night uh, third all nighter Slam in the Park the one I talked about mm-hmm. Strathclyde Park predating Tea in the Park and it, it, Eugene did the kind of flowery hippie artwork with the apple and mm-hmm. out of it, which um, yeah, these the, everybody went to the same clubs in Glasgow. You know, yeah, it's a small guys with guitars would come and dance to acid house. You know? Yeah, that's that's what it was like in Edinburgh as well. That you had those those worlds coming together, and then latterly you also had the traditional music scene coming in uh, um, with everyone. You know, that mixing with the with the electronic music scene. But it's interesting because it wasn't like that everywhere. Um, there's 
I think we are quite unusual in that with with our cities and and there being that cross that cross pollination. Um, but I mean, the um, did you ever? You said you wanted to you wanted to put out something out by Eugene. I mean, did you did you ever sort of dabble with other? Types of music or other other genres at all. I mean, I mean, not really. I mean, Wind Dove, we're, we're a kind of crossover indie kind of dance. I, I did not yeah. assume as zero zero two. So I mean, we, we did dabble with it at the beginning. I mean, Andrew Weatherall, who released loads of. We, I mean, we're great friends with Andrew through the years, and he did loads of remixes and releases for us for over twenty five years. You know, and, and until he sadly passed away last year, and then um, you know, we talked about that compilation where he was playing the rockabilly and the punk and the yes. dance, and Soma was the label that released it. You know, in the in the electronic world, it seemed a bit odd, and it did become a, quite a success. But Andrew would tell people, he goes, "Oh, I hope I haven't wrecked one of my favourite labels by giving them that." But, it, 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 it was a licensing nightmare trying to track back uh, so, you know songs and artists and uh, families who who had the, the copyright ancestors. of the dead artists you know so back to the, the 50s and 60s and stuff like that it, it, if you're looking for that someone's compiled it on Spotify as uh, sci-fi lo-fi which was the title of the compilation uh, it's well worth a listen. There's three or four of them. Um, and um, I mean, back in the day, as part of it, we were putting the club nights on. We also put Primal Scream and Alex Patterson from the Orb and Weather One in an old little dance hall that still did tea dances in the afternoon in Glasgow called the Plaza. So this was uh, that period when the label started. There was just this whole slam supported the Stone Roses in a big tent in Glasgow Green. Sean Ryder and his dad and Bez are in the sub club after a gig, you know, it was, it was a good symbiosis and co- collaboration. I mean, I think he did ask Ian Brown to sing on a slam track, but it just never happened in the end, but, you know, it, it, it's something we toyed with. And, I mean, you, on the event side of things, what was it that you got out of that? I mean, did you... If you're if you're running an event, I guess it's not so easy to be on the dance floor and you know getting involved with it. But when it's a club, you can. When it's a club, you can. When it's when it was the slam tent and tea in the park, you had maybe eight, ten artists a day. So you, there's a lot of a lot of work to be done backstage, making sure everyone's going to get there on time. But I would always walk out front as much as possible. You know that that energy at the the front of the house, you know, is what it's all about, definitely. Do you still have that now with the Riverside Festival? Yeah, I mean, again, there's a lot of things you have to do, but whenever I can, I'll just walk around the whole place and try and soak it up. I mean, it, it's like everything, you, you try and put the best party on you can, but you sometimes think, I wish I could just go to a party like that, but then you think, well, then what? I need to get another job. You know? do you, I mean, is there any <laughs> job? Is there anywhere that you, is there somewhere you go for, you know, for your own kind of clubbing or uh, festival experiences? Is there, is there somewhere like where you have a kind of bus in Berlin? Berlin, in Berlin, you know, you go in there and get lost and it, it's very unpretentious, very weird and uh, very, very wonderful because no one, no one pulls their phone out. Yeah. You know, people are just into music and there's a lot of variety, you know, there's a little bar where it's all quite housey and you can walk back into this industrial techno space, there's lots of colourful characters. What about you, Glenn, on the A&R side of things? Do you, do you what, what's the kind of buzz from that? What's, what do you, um, what do you really enjoy with it? Um, but the- <laughs> It's all. I mean, there's always a buzz from getting records out and people appreciating them, getting them playing the radio and things like that. Sort of, um, but it's, it's de- developing new talent. Really, we're we're doing a lot of releases for, with uh, new Glasgow artists, for our Scottish artists. We're trying to sort of really champion lots of new, young, uh, up and coming sort of techno artists from Scotland, especially Glasgow. Um, so that's really exciting. We're doing like, lots of various artists, sort of EPs with with uh, new artists, up and coming artists from Scotland. So. Um, so that that's great as well as working obviously on we've got a big project from Slam coming up um, over the next six months and 
an album from Rebecca next year and an album from Deep Chord uh, hopefully the end of next year as well so there's, there's just lots of, I mean you always get a buzz from just pulling like great projects together you know and how do you you know as, how has your signing policy changed from from the early days or over the past 30 years has there been a has there been a, a change in approach or do you not really man we just we just released records that we loved you know I mean we're maybe a bit more detailed about and we're a bit more fussy about knocking things back I mean there's so much music out there now it's it's really kind of it's really important to you know, make sure that the quality stays high um, but we've always had a little quality control because there's been a lot of us and we used to argue and we still argue um, people if people somebody believes in, in a record then or an artist that we want to sign, then you know you you can you can have an argument about it and like push it through if you if you really believe in it. And we signed an artist uh, from Russia recently called Namases, who's a kind of EBM kind of new beat type thing. It's quite eighty sounding punky, and um, it's totally quite different from what we normally release. And you know, and that that's a, a really good kind of reaction from people and. It's quite a bit of a curveball for us and pe- people. Yeah, I, I really like, enjoyed that actually. And from from the local scene, we've got. Darren and Rosie work in the, the label, but they also release as Quail and Asia, and some of that material's come out. Mm-hmm. And that's good to see, you know, the, the, the future generation. And a lot of the artists when he's talking about there, we'll, we'll try and find them a slot at things like the Riverside Festival. We've got a satellite stage happening this year, which is fully focused on local talent. And we'll always try and find slots at pressure or at return to mono at the sub club and pe- most people are doing their own thing yeah we're bringing back the slam tent which should have been in August but it's going to be next year now so there's still symbiosis between the record label and the events and, and that's always been the case through the years you know and, I mean is there do you have something that is your is your kind of signal for I want to sign this? I mean, is it, do you, is it something that's got you dancing around your living room or something? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know, um, man. I mean, it's just a feeling, you know. It's just one of those things, you know. You just kind of know, and and generally we agree, you know. Generally we we, we all go right like that, like that. You, you know more when you don't want to put it out, don't you? Yeah. Something is maybe just one part in it that it's just. That's just not going to work. Yeah. And do you get involved in the in the recording or the creative process? Do you, not it, anymore, man. We, we used to have we'd do a bit of guidance and stuff like that. But I mean, in the old A and R kind of yeah. uh, textbook way. But you know, you you let artists be artists, man. I mean, you know, that's what indie labels do, and that's that's you know, occasionally we'll say like, take the vocal out and we'll release it, you know, <laughs> something like that, you know. But you know, generally, we just let the artists, you know, be artists. And um, I think one of the things that, you know, you've already mentioned, but it's, it's, you know, this is partly what the whole Local Hero Strand is about, is that that development. And I think what's what's interesting, because um, I've literally just written about Rosie's, uh, who's recording as Aisha, um, written about her new single, or solo single, and or EP rather, um, is that element that you have someone that you're that works for the label that you you know released on the label and that you've um, that you've also put it on as a as a DJ and is that something that you do you look for people to develop on the on the label side and and then also have them learn about how that side of things work but also then use that as a as a kind of and part of the overall equation to develop them as artists. It's not a conscious thing, man. You know, um, we employed Rosie first, um, and um, and then she, st- she she was making bits of music, and then she she, she started making music with Darren, um, and then developed. It's taken her. It's taken two or three years for her to develop to where she is now, which is like she's she's got her, getting her own sound. And um, you know she's definitely developed as an artist, so not really. It's not a conscious sort of thing. Same with Darren. I mean, he 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 ha- he always made music, and actually he he runs a club night himself called Animal Farm. Called Animal Farm. So um, so it's not not really. No, it's not a conscious thing, really. You know, it's just you again. You're just employing or working with like-minded people, basically. And do you think that that's something that you you know helps? 
you keep yourself finger on the pulse if you've got the, the young team in and they're, they're, they're DJing and they're on their own nights and De- stuff. Definitely, definitely, definitely helps a lot. Yeah, yeah, people, people, younger people getting, especially if, you know, they're out and they're, they're definitely, they're totally into the scene and DJing and finding new music and stuff like that. But I mean, it's well, Stuart and Ord are still out every weekend now that restrictions are eased that, you know, DJing around the world, DJing around Europe and UK. So, um, so everybody's got their their own kind of um, the mining mining facilities, if you like, to about new music and what they like and how we should move things forward. How do you two find your your new music then? How do we find? Well, I mean, I get sent hundreds of tr- tracks every week. So, and do you just have do you have like a do you have like a session or a sort of time set aside each week where you're like, right, I'm just going to listen to. You know, it's for just, the things. You know, you've just got music on all the time, whether it's radio or mixes or SoundCloud or you're in trend, you hear about a DJ, so you want to hear what they play. And you can do that now, can't you, with the internet? I mean, we have to. We have to put time aside to listen to demos and listen to new music, but also. You know, we're compiling stuff all the time. We we started a new label called Avoidant, which is this label uh, two years ago, and, and it's electro vibe. It's kind of original Detroit electro with a modern kind of twist. And um, we're um, putting a compilation together in, in, in November, so we're pulling that together. So that's taken me out of about forty tracks and whittled it down to about sixteen, seventeen tracks. So. You know, working on things like that all the time, so that that takes a lot of time up. And you know, again, you're working with new artists um, from around the world, so there's loads of records coming out. I mean, someone release about three records a month, um, and then Avoidant releases one a month, and then we're doing albums, maybe a couple of albums a year, maybe two or three albums a year. So there's just a ton of music always, always get coming through the office, you know. I mean. The- I guess through your closeness to it all, you must see different phases and different um, different trends within the within electronic music. Um, have there been any periods where you're like, God, you know, there's? And I, I, I say this because I think think the last time I saw you might have touched on this, but there was a period where everything rose a little bit and then just plateaued, and you never really had that kind of um, that payoff on a lot of tracks, it just seemed to just sort of plod along. Um, recently, I've noticed that changing, that it's, it's kind of, you're getting the kind of builds and there is, you know, and I've talked about it with, the, you know, some some relatives or kids or friends of mine who seem to be very much on that sort of trip, that, you know, that tip these days that, you know, you maybe had like in the 90s, um, those plateaus aren't as popular anymore. Is that is there been periods where you're like, fuck, I wish someone would just make something like this? Or are you able to just find it if you if you look hard enough? I don't know, man. I mean, you know, music I mean, goes through phases and fashions and stuff like that. I mean, certainly the banging techno is still a thing at the moment. And um, it's sometimes it can be ear bleeding and you know and sometimes you want a, want a drop but you know it's like yeah, it seemed to get more ravey didn't it like, like, it and the it's other end really of it you, the thing Andrew Weatherall was doing but Deep Core to Glenn mentioned a lot of younger producers it's this, this kind of dubbier end and slower end of techno but it's still got the the, 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 the body the depth the kind of I mean, I think the kids are into banging, bleeding, bleeding ear techno at the moment with with a rave kind of edge to it. Maybe even a happy hardcore Almost edge. Touching on trance. Touching on trance and happy hardcore. The, the, the evil words. But, um, you know, so, uh, you know, the, again, as it's, it's a fashion thing, isn't it? And, and there's faces, and I'm sure it'll go back. BPMs will drop, and, you know, it'll go back to a groove, and, you know, th- you know so. Uh, do you want to like keep yourself so excited about it musically? I mean, is there... It's always developing, you know, it's always changing, but with, with a nod to the past, and, and production techniques are always changing as well, so it's always interesting to see how it develops. But again, you know, we put out kind of quite banging dance floor techno, but we'll also put ambient music, and we'll also put out a bit of... Um, uh, um, uh, like like deep chord, like a uh, dub techno, or or sort of other kind of genres which keep it interesting, and it's not just one thing, you know. So that just keeps it all a bit more interesting, you know. 
Yeah, and there's stuff, stuff for the dance floor and for the club, and there's stuff that sounds good at home. Or, or on the beach, when you're on your holiday. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, what's interesting to me, and I, I guess, we, well, I know we're all roughly of the same vintage, you know, in our 50s, but I still have this thing where I'll, I'll, someone will send me something and I, I still get that where I'll, you know, almost fall off my seat going, this is fucking great, or, you know, mm-hmm. writing about something that no one else has heard yet. So you just say, Yeah, and it's just, singer. you know, when people go at me, ah, oh, yeah, there's no decent music being made anymore, and I'm like, what are you fucking talking yeah, about? You know, I mean, I guess the hard thing is there's so many, it's so democratic now that there's so many, it's much easier to make music, there's so, self-release it, there's so much music out there. The hard thing is to find it, and if you rely on a Spotify playlist, then you're only getting one person's opinion, you know, it's, it's a very random thing finding the right music. I think a, a DJ's job with club and radio has become more important than ever because not everyone has got the patience or the capacity to, to listen to 10,000 things and find 10 or 100 good ones within that. Have you, I mean, obviously you've been going for 30 years, your, your enthusiasm, your, or rather, I don't like the word enthusiasm, I think your passion for it really is is still there. Um, do you think that's one of the main reasons that you've you've continued for 30 years or are there other elements around, you know, adapting the company? I'm thinking, you know, in the, the Napster period, which we, we touched on earlier, where people would just stop buying music. Um, that was tough. That, 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 yeah. that, that, that was a recession and a music recession, I remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, were, we nearly went tits up at that point, yeah, as lots of labels did at the time, you know. We had to downsize, we had to... I mean, change. I, I don't know why we even had a water cooler, I don't know who got it, but we did have, you know, the guy who bring up the water, it comes out cold, and the tap water was perfectly good and stuff, and so it was good to, But I remember we couldn't afford it anymore, we're like, just take it away, you know. <laughs> And I think the pipes were a bit dodgy in that office. <laughs> though, you know, uh, actually, is that the office that was next door to the shop that sold like really yeah, 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 and cross and stuff? <laughs> yeah, it was the, kind of... The gun they tried to ban and all that. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you think that the, the company has changed since then? How did you get through it? I mean, how did you, you know, to what do you attribute this, this longevity and the fact that you're tenacity, still here? Tenacity. I mean, we really just, we got down to pretty much just us, with, with, I mean, it was tough, but we got through it, we got through it. Pink-headed stupidity, I think. <laughs> and has there been a time where you just thought, I've had enough of this? I mean, what's the closest you've come to just throwing in the towel? You have those times, you have those moments now and again, don't you, you know? But I think everybody has those kind of things, you know. What was it that caused them? I mean, was there... I mean, for me, maybe on, 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 on more on the event side, I mean... It's just when, it, when you see how it, it's become a real career as opposed to a passion, you know, and you you see these layers surrounding an artist that make it hard to actually get to the, the reason you want to book somebody and put them on to DJ isn't so you can speak to five people about what kind of champagne the person likes or what kind of car they'll drive in and stuff. And you just think, fuck off. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. It's, I mean, do you think that you got me the wrong tequila and all that bullshit? Wait, what, what place is that got in this scene? Do you find that you're just disinclined to work with people like that, and you just you going to work with people more that share your your general ethos and your outlook? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it takes a while to get there, <clears throat> but yeah, you realise that that's I'm not. You know, I don't want to do that. And do you think that that's going to possibly change with the, you know, I think... Well, we call it the reset, don't we? Yeah. This is the reset. Because so what I was thinking about was that, you know, I was at the International Live Music Conference while, you know, the pandemic was just taking off, you know, Mar- early March um, 2020, and there were these insane stories of exclusivity clauses and, you know, tours. Yeah, it's and big companies buying it all up and... And it just seems like with the uncertainty now, it almost is, is there a possibility that, you well, know, that, that quick reaction, pulling together something in a couple of months, but where it's 
also going to be more of a focus on on people the local local scenes scenes. and the underground artists. Yeah, and this is what we all hope for from top to bottom. I think the vested interests are, are a thing of the past in my book. Now. And you've you've obviously got Riverside coming up um, in a month's time. I mean, how do you? How do you see that in terms of what's been different about, obviously you've got to jump through loads of different um, yeah, because, hoops around COVID, but I mean, in terms of the booking and the, you know, the general event, what do you see as different? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess, I mean, so far I've found we, we've got, I guess, one one headliner each day, Jamie XX on the Friday, Disclosure on the Saturday, and... And we went on the Sunday, and then lots of interest and exciting underground talent. But you know, on the rest of the bill, over the three stages, including plenty of locals and even the, the people that are doing the headlining, there's no kind of asshole attitudes coming from any of the agents or tour managers or anything. So I think we picked the right people, and I guess after so many years, we should be good at picking that. But you know, as I said before, it's not always been. Uh, easy to get along with the whole entourage thing but I think um, yeah it's, for me it's going to be the best gig yet but it's going to be the hardest one because we're going to have to achieve something in the next four weeks which usually we're worried about can we sell the tickets what if it's windy you know there's a lot of details in an event responsibility and risk assessments but we've got this extra layer of COVID security that so far there's no actual guidance on how do you deal with people coming into an event? So we have to kind of work hard behind the scenes to make this happen. And uh, getting back to what you were saying about why you still do it, I guess in this instance, it's probably the biggest challenge of any event we've ever done. And that's the kind of thing that gets you up in the morning. It actually keeps you up at night. So <laughs> I, I've been waking up at five, six o'clock, getting up and just starting, starting to make sure every detail is attended to. Do, do you think there's an element of being, having some sort of adrenaline addiction or some sort of like masochistic streak? Because I was speaking to a Romanian promoter friend of mine who, you know, actually as a sideline organised the Pope's visit to Romania and she's, <laughs> she's finally taken a few weeks off and, you know, and I could tell she was, you know, she she was champing at the bit to start doing it again. And I'm like, but you know, you, she, I remember her telling me that she'd gone to start, gone to the other city to start work with all her winter clothes. And by the time the people visit had happened, she'd been working so hard. She was still wearing these kind of winter warm boots stuff, and warm, warm stuff. stuff and had no like summer clothes. I mean, yeah, you have to remember to sleep and eat in between it. I mean, I've given up the booze for the whole, the whole weed in, which is good because otherwise you'd be having a glass of wine and then a headache in the morning, you know. So that, that's one thing that I do, just really zen like. But Lots of ambient music on while I'm glued to my computer, planning stuff. Why do you do it though? I mean, if it's. It, what what is it if you it's are what we do but once you once you accept the responsibility of doing it you just start panic if you don't do what needs to be done you start panicking this you know what how many thousands of people are going to be pissed off if I did something wrong you know yeah something wrong and then you, if you as you said if you walk onto the dance floor and see everyone having a good time that makes it worthwhile. And what have you got coming up? Um, I mean, are there any things that in the pipeline, we appreciate that the there's obviously for events there there is the uncertainty around COVID and the you know who knows what's going to happen in a year's time. But I mean, are there any things that you're you're planning to do? Any new elements to to Soma um, that you're you're gonna go gonna do in the next in the next year or two? Well, with Soma, no. I mean, we're just we're just sort of kicking at the door. We've got loads of releases ready to go to, right into 2022. So, I mean, we, we you know, we've got... I think we'll, we'll definitely put a party together with a lot of the Soma artists together again. We haven't done one of those for a while. And is there anything that you, you still want to do? Are there any things that you're like, God, I'd like to organise an event here or I'd like to put on a, a certain, uh, cert, get a certain release in here? I mean, 
Not really. I actually do regret not going to Andrew Weatherall's festival in Carcassonne in France when he was running it. I said one of the Silver Boys. once. Uh, one of the Silver Control Boys lives at Craig now, and um, yeah, that's that's a regret. I'd like to I'd like to go to maybe maybe more more festivals in Europe when everything opens up again. You know. And I've got to ask you. I mean, there's there's always um, someone that. Uh, a label's turned down, um, or an artist that they've turned down. Um, we, <laughs> we, we, had, we, we, we had a, we had an opportunity to uh, to put on Lewis Capaldi at Wine Days, and we we're just a bit like, ah, oh, not really getting this, not really feeling it, you know. And um, so it didn't happen. Um, but, I mean, we we kind of joke about it now anyway. But it's, um, did you ever have someone that was? Was keen to be well, released to. It says it, Mojo back in the day with like, they released that lady track. It was yeah. a kind of derivative kind of French touch kind yeah. of sound. Yeah. They had the massive right, but we didn't turn that particular one down. We, yeah. we wouldn't have put it out, but it was just there was a thing in the Daily Record that someone stuck on the wall in the old office, and it was Mojo snubbed from Scott's label. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the biggest record of the year that year. Yeah, yeah. We I think we would not be happy about that. <laughs> But, uh, gents, thanks very much. No problem. And, uh, uh, an absolute pleasure to uh, uh, have you as my Same. local heroes. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for even considering us at that. We just, we just get up and get on with it, don't we?